So when you think about Dayton, the Miami Valley area, certain family names come to, uh, come to mind. You know, there's the Pattersons, the Wrights. Uh, I'm very pleased that another family, which is, which is quite prominent, has a long history in the Miami Valley area, the Morrises. Um, this is actually a lectureship which is established um, you know, to not only bring in great science, but also to, um, to acknowledge uh, the, this great family, the Morrises. So this is the Earl H. Morris MD Endowed Lectureship. Now the Morrises actually have been here in the Miami Valley. They have a farm uh, in the Bellbrook area, which is now the Morris Preserve, which has been donated to the Bellbrook uh, area, which is, uh, I guess, a nature preserve, turning into a nature preserve. Um, this is a, a really interesting family in that Dr. Morris, uh, who is the, you know, has had very prominent uh, family members, uh, including um, Dr. Mariana Morris, who was the former chair of pharmacology. Thank you so much, Mariana, for coming up from Florida. And um, then other. Uh, Dr. Susan Morris, who's actually a family practitioner similar to her grandfather. Uh, and this has been a family that has been very in tune to, um, to improving the, the community. So I'd like to take a moment, actually, a round of applause for this family, the Morris family. I actually had a pleasure to have dinner with many of the Morris clan last night, and you could see that this family is going to keep producing and keep giving to the community. Uh, what a quite. Now, the, the, the Morris lecturer this year, um, I think, endows many of the findings in the Morris family. Um, Dr. Murphy, although he, was, he spent two weeks being born in Seymour, Indiana, he actually grew up here in Ohio. He graduated from Maslin High, the Maslin Tigers. Um, he went to uh, Mount Union, uh, where he graduated in, in Alliance, Ohio, where he graduated summa cum, magna cum laude with a degree in chemistry. Uh, he was always interested in science. He went on to MIT for his PhD, working with Beban, who was considered the father of organic mass spectrometry. Now, Bob didn't work on this machine, by the way. Uh, and then he went on to uh, a postdoc uh, at, um, at Harvard and worked with Karnofsky and worked with a lot of other very... Dr. Murphy then went to Colorado, University of Colorado, took a job in 1971 uh, in the Department of Pharmacology. And he's thinking, pharmacology? Why pharmacology? Well, pharmacology in toxicology, they are the, the, the total application of medications and drug development to human and other disease. So it's a very important field. And Dr. Murphy has done um, much, and he's actually was trained by the father of organic mass spectrometry, and Bob became basically the, the shining light, probably the most famous uh, lipid mass spectrometrist in the world. Uh, and we're quite pleased to have him here. Uh, he's, I, I can go on and on about all the things in his uh, CV, over, I think, 510 publications, including 16 co-authored with me. <laughs> and there would have been more, but this is the kind of person that Dr. Murphy is. There are a couple of times where he did the mass spec for our work, he said, no, Jeff, don't include me as an author. Don't include me as an author. And you don't see that very often. I think once you reach 510 publications, you probably get tired of updating your CV all the time, <laughs> which is a problem. Um, Bob has done a lot of work in leukotrienes. He actually did the mass spectrometry, uh, which helped decipher what the slow reacting substances of anaphylaxis were. He's done a lot of work on leukotriene before, and he's been involved in the lipidomics maps, and he's just been a total lipid guy forever. So his talk today is on mass spectrometry approaches to lipidomic studies. And please give a Raider welcome. Right there, right there.
Well, thank you very much. Thank the Morris family for this. This was wonderful uh, to invite me to come here and give this. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And I'm going to talk about, at the risk of, of, not, of actually telling you things that you're not too interested in, and that's lipids. Um, you know, we don't teach much lipid biochemistry in, in graduate school anymore, unfortunately. It's a fascinating area of, of biochemistry. Um, and Jeff sort of asked me to give a little bit of introduction to that part to really understand what this title is all about. Now, lipidomics is a relatively new area in which you'll see at the end of this with some specific examples of what you can do with measuring all the lipids that you possibly can can do, uh, which is somewhat limited in terms of total number of lipids, and you'll understand that uh, shortly. And then I'm going to be using mass spectrometry to do this. Now this picture is of the world's first mass spectrometer, and that was made by J.J. Thompson, who was a physicist, a British physicist at Cambridge University. And you probably learned about him and when you took physics, because he's the one who discovered the electron. After he did the electron at the end of the 1800s, he started just trying to understand what positive rays of electricity were, and this is the machine he used that with. And that turned out to be the first mass spectrometer, the world's first machine. Now, the machines we use now are somewhat larger than this. This is not very big. It's about as, almost as big as my little computer here. Uh, and the ones we use now are quite a bit bigger, although they used to be huge. Now they're, they're smaller because of advances in, in electronics. And I'll try and explain how we use these machines and what kind of information you can get out of them to really allow you to delve into lipid biochemistry. But to start this, I want to ask this question, what are lipids? What do you think lipids are? So I asked Google, the little echo, what are lipids? And this is what, they, what Google says lipids are. And I did this yesterday. Uh, and so it's any class of organic compounds that are fatty acids or their derivatives that are insoluble in water or soluble in organic solvents. Good Lord, people think lipids are defined by organic uh, solubility and water insolubility. That's no way one should enter into a biochemical study by thinking about their solubilities. Typically, we think about lipid, uh, we think about uh, biochemical molecules like proteins by how they're made, and we define them that way linear polymers of amino acids and so on like that. So a couple years ago, we came up with this alternative definition. And I want you to think about this as, as really as a way to define lipids, because there's many examples of lipids which are totally water soluble and not soluble in organic solvents and the other way around. So there certainly are some um, proteins that are the other way around. So anyhow, uh, <clears throat> what we came up with is that lipids are hydrophobic or amphipathic molecules. In other words, they have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties that originate either by condensations of carbanion thioesters or carbocations of isoprene units. Now, I know that's not so revealing to you all, and I wanted to show you what this chemistry is, but they're made by sp rather specific and only two pathways uh, to make these molecules. So the first one you probably did study in biochemistry, and that's the, the condensation of uh, thioesters with fatty acid synthase. Now all fatty acid synthase does is it, it brings in close uh, an acetyl group a, uh, which is uh, uh, covalent linked to a, as by a thioester to acyl carrier protein to malonyl-CoA which is, uh, or malonyl attached to an acyl carrier protein. And by decarboxylation, you form a, long, a little bit longer chain. So you add two carbons. Right. Now, okay, so anyhow, you can see I have the, uh, the uh, nascent, and maybe I can put my arrow up here, the, this uh, nascent uh, carbanion, which is sort of formed in the reactive intermediate right in here. And that carries out that mechanism, chain elongation. Got a couple more biochemical steps, uh, fatty acid synthase in humans, uh, a single protein carries out all these steps, Re reduction of that ketone, forming a hydroxyl group, then, then forming a double bond, then saturating the double bond. So now you have this growing nascent hydrocarbon chain. And this repeats itself over and over. And so typically uh, in your body, the ACL groups uh, are going to have 16, 18, 20, 20 carbons in length. And, and it comes from this reaction. Now the other pathway, this carbocation pathway, you probably didn't learn too much about which is a shame because this is the oldest pathway on earth to form lipids. And before 
uh, well, this was probably about two million years ago, these reactions were taking place in archaeobacteria. Uh, and of course, archaeobacteria are still around. If you go to Yellowstone National Park, you'll see a lot of archaeobacteria formed in the hot, in, uh, living in the hot pools. But what they, how they make hydro, um, lipids is they do this uh, uh, enzymatic reaction here. You pull off this proton and the double bond attacks and you have a good leaving group of this pyrophosphate group. And now you have a chain 10 carbons long with some double bonds in it and this is geronyl pyrophosphate. Now you would think, well, there, is there any examples of this still around now? Well, it turns out uh, ACL chemistry um, sort of captured the ability to make these dimethylallyl pyrophosphate and so they bypassed some of the early steps but the later steps exist very strongly in your body now. They form a class, two different big classes of lipids including one of the really important ones, steroids. They all come from this pathway. This goes on to make 30 carbons uh, length and saturates all double bonds and forms squalene, not saturates double bonds but removes any functional groups and you have squalene. Squalene cyclizes into what looks like to be a steroid nucleus. So anyhow, <clears throat> with these two pathways, you form eight different types of lipids. And these are very different lipid classes. And, and we sort of came up with these names and classifications in this program that was sponsored by NIH. A, 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 it was a glue grant which brought a consortium of universities together to look at lipid biochemistry. Fatty acids, a lot of people know those are lipids. Polyketides, probably don't know too much about them. They're in plant biochemistry. We don't make any polyketides in mammalian biochemistry. Glycerol lipids are the, the, uh, the triglycerides, diglycerides, <coughs> monoglycerides, uh, which there are thousands of these molecules. The glycerol phospholipids, we pulled them out because they were rather a large class. There's six major phospholipid head groups. And these are the, the types of lipids which, fo which form membranes. They're, they're, they're self-assembling uh, molecules and they can form vesicles. And so every one of your cells in the body is, is covered with a membrane, which is a lipid bilayer, which are glycerol phospholipids by and large. Now, sphingolipids are lipids which have a sphingosine-like backbone, a little bit different uh, than the uh, glycerol lipids. So they have a, a long chain base which becomes acylated and they also can have, uh, be decorated with, with carbohydrate structures. They have very complex structures. And these are the ones like if you're a type A uh, blood or type B blood or O blood, it's these molecules, these sphingolipids, which are determining your classification. Now saccharolipids are sugars which have lipids attached to them. We have a few examples, but mostly in the bacterial world uh, are, are saccharolipids and how, how bacteria form their envelope, they have saccharolipids on them. Uh, so those are all made by the carbanion, the thioester biochemistry, all those ones, those first six. Uh, so all lipids in there, but the lower ones are made by the carbocation uh, mechanisms. The uh, prenols, things like ubiquinones, um, dolichols, uh, very important in, in, in carbohydrate biochemistry, and then steroids, sterols or steroids, a uh, huge class of very important bioactive molecules. So you can see there's a huge class of these molecules. Uh, uh, there's, I mean, a uh, uh, huge diversity in these classes of molecules. And that uh, it makes it a challenging uh, pro um, uh, program to try and develop means to measure all these molecules. And this, this is really very difficult because they're so different in their behavior uh, in terms of mass spectrometry and certainly their behavior within cell biology. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it would be nice if one could measure these things and relate them to something uh, like disease states or the, the effects of drugs on some of these things. Sort of in the same sort of thing where artificial intelligence is using these omic technologies, genomics, proteomics, and now li lipidomics, if one could measure these molecules. So the other kind of omics which has evolved very recently is metabolomics. And this is the, measure, the measurement of all these small intermediates of enzymatic reactions in some biofluid like perhaps blood, uh, plasma, or urine. And so there's been this area sort of evolving at the same time, measuring all these metabolites. And, uh, and typically the people looking at metabolomics sort of see the world this way. 
either green or red. They see green, what they want to measure, metabolites. Those are when you shake up a sample of plasma with something like chloroform, methanol, stuff which is water soluble goes up. Uh, and those are the things you want to measure as metabolites. So metabolites of the, the Krebs pathway or something like that, a citric acid cycle. Those in the lower layer, well, you throw that away. That's where the lipids are. You don't care about those. And they think, well, the people doing lipidomics, they're going to look at the lower layer. And so it is. So this is what the way I think the world is divided in biochemistry. Now, I see the world a little bit different. I see the world this way. Uh, it turns out that the metabolomics is a very su successful technique, but there's only about 1,000 to 2,000 molecules they have to measure. And they do very well with that, with both mass spectrometry and NMR. And about 90% of the, all the metabolites which are present, they can measure. And they can do a good job with that. Now, lipidomics is a much bigger area. And, we'll, and we'll, you'll, you'll see that in part by the number of families of these molecules. But within each family, there are thousands of species. We call these molecular species. You'll see a little bit of that in some of the actual data that I will, I will show you. And we're not very good at covering all of these lipids. This is a very difficult, challenging process and has continued. But nonetheless, we still persevere and we try and uh, do a, uh, a good job. But there's other challenges in trying to analyze all these lipids. And one of them is, is sort of illustrated with this histogram here. Which, uh, sh which shows you uh, the number of species on the y-axis and the concentration that you find just in plasma. So I, I sort of gathered this data from one of our lipid map studies uh, where we looked at uh, nor uh, sort of an artificial plasma as a plasma that, that NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology, made by mixing the plasma from 100 different Americans. And they just sort of mixed them. They sort of balanced it somehow. They didn't tell us. And so it was sort of an average plasma, so but totally artificial. Um, and we looked at what we, found, what we could find in terms of lipids, and there are six laboratories in the United States doing this, uh, and they each had a different lipid class. Now, I turned out to be in charge of measuring the neutral lipids, and they turned out to be the highest concentration compounds in plasma. And they're present in millimolar concentration. So these are cholesterol esters and triglycerides, and we carry huge quantities of these. Now these are totally insoluble molecules. These are water insoluble. So how are they in plasma? Well, they're in plasma because they're bound within a protein particle, lipoproteins. So we circulate lipoproteins, a, a, a protein covering these lipids which are present in the center of this, and they're, they're not exposed to water at all. So these are the, the things which you are learned to hate, H, uh, LDLs, for example, if you're have a weight problem, and, and all of us, some of us, when you get older, we take statins to try and decrease these guys, cholesterol esters in particular. Very high concentration, millimolars, not too challenging. Most of, the, of these compounds are in micromolar concentrations, uh, phospholipids, for example, uh, but many of them are in nanomolar and picomolar concentrations, and, and the presence of very bioactive molecules like prostaglandins and and leukotrienes and, and ceramides and so on like that. They're present in very small quantities. So the challenge is we can find these over 12 orders of magnitude, 12 logs. That's a huge range. So you have to have something that can measure something at very, very low concentration, which means ultimate sensitivity. Uh, one can always dilute samples to, if you have such a, a capability. And that, that capability is, in essence, the mass spectrometer. It's an extraordinarily sensitive device that allows you to get into that region. And so one can think about being able to measure uh, concentration of these lipid substances, which are normally circulating in plasma, over a wide range of concentrations. And that sort of, with the development of the new tools of mass spectrometry, uh, it became clear that we could actually come uh, close to thinking about measuring many different lipid species within a biological sample, a biological fluid, for example. And that's the field of lipidomics, which, uh, which uh, Jeff, if you don't like this talk, by the way, it's Jeff's problem, not mine. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the field of, of lipidomics. So uh, there are n uh, numerous places which are doing lipidomic studies, trying to find um, and measure li lipids which are present in, uh, in, in various samples from uh, uh, plasma to urine to cells uh, to uh, tissues and so on like that. And I wanted to go over how we actually do this process 
Uh, it's a little bit complicated and not entirely clear how you would do this. And it's because it's so complicated, you don't enter into this lightly. So you really want to have a biological question right at first. So I have in that black box up there um, that you really are driven to do this because of some particular biochemical study. Maybe you want to find out, is there something in that lipid biochemistry is involved in a disease process? And if you knew that, maybe you could do something about that disease process. Uh, it, and you can also, in basic studies of research, maybe you knock out a gene and you want to find out what effect does that have in terms of the population of these lipid substances. And so you really, you want to find out a global question uh, about lipid biochemistry in general. So the first step you enter into after you've said, well, okay, I'll, I'll go do a lipidomic study, is you have, to, you have to engage some sort of plan of how you're going to do this. The very first step is you want to isolate the lipid from other molecules, uh, including water. Uh, but you have to typically do an isolation either by extraction, by solid phase extraction, ca really capitalizing on the hydrophobic character of most lipids or even a liquid extraction. And once you have an extract, you now are ready to start analyzing it. So I've outlined here uh, three different uh, studies. I don't know if I can, yeah, a little pointed here. You, there's three general ways I'm going to talk about you do these studies. So the, the first one is sort of a popular one. It turns out to be pretty easy, and we'll talk about how you do that. It's termed shotgun lipidomics. Uh, the second one is a chromatographic based, and so you have liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. And then the third way, is, it's somewhat esoteric, and it turns out to be trying to capitalize on the power of the, of the modern mass spectrometer, doing targeted analysis. And I'll try and show you some of the advantages of these things. So this, um, when you do target analysis, you're looking at very specific lipids and you have to know something about the lipid. You're looking at them. Uh, very often times you use stabilized soap dilution to quantitate them. And the, um, these other techniques are really fairly unbiased. You don't really ask the question specifically about lipids. You want to have the lipids tell you what is present and you need to analyze the data. So that's the unbiased approach. Uh, both the chromatographic based and the shotgun based. Uh, and so they are a little bit different way that you approach the problem of what is in that extract that you're looking at. So we'll look at shotgun lipidomics. Like I say, it's been fairly popular to do shotgun lipidomics and where you just take a look at the extract without any real purification. Although sometimes you do some purification, maybe let's say maybe a thin, layer, a thin layer separation of some lipids or something like that. But by and large, you use different aspects of how you make ions of lipids in the mass spectrometer to look at this huge mixture that you have in this crude extract. So this is an example of a work uh, that was done by uh, uh, Ling Han. And um, these are the phosphatidylethanolamine uh, which are phospholipids, which are present in a mouse heart. And they're doing a type of mass spectrometry called precursor ion scanning. They're looking, and I'll explain what that means shortly, where you look for specific fatty acids, for example, 18-1 uh, or 18-0 fatty acids. And here you see that ions uh, 766 and 790 have that particular fatty acid uh, isolated to the glycerol phospho ethanolamine backbone. But you see the mixture is quite complex and there's majors and there's a lot of small ones, minor components. And you can ask these questions about precursor ion scanning, about phosphatidylethanolamine. Now these were done by negative ions. We look at both positive ions and negative ions in lipid uh, mass spectrometry. And this is a positive ion looking at the same extract but doing a different kind of scanning, and it's called neutral loss scanning, one of the tricks you can do in a tandem quadrupole machine. And you can see that you can look at, at different triglycerides, which have these fatty acids <coughs> in them. They're different masses, even though they were in the same sample. One of the problems with the shotgun lipidomics, sometimes some of the things you, get, you see are not this class you think you're looking at. These are, uh, uh, those compounds are uh, phosphatidylcholine, major species which make positive ions in this extract, and they turn out to be in the, in the sort of crude window of these neutral lipids here. 
But one can get around that if you understand that. And there are certainly some real advantages and disadvantages of doing shotgun lipidomics. First of all, it's very easy to implement if you have a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer to do these kind of experiments. And I'll probably come and explain what those experiments really, how you really do them. Um, you can also do them with a quadrupole time of flight, another type of instrument, popular type of instrument. You get a large number of molecular species. Uh, the, typically, though, they're the minors, they're the major species. It's tough to really see the minor species and to really get useful information about that. Um, now, the identification of lipid is really improved by high resolution mass spectrometry. And I'll show you an example specifically of that, uh, what high resolution brings to the table with this. And also another technique I won't talk about, and that's ion mobility, relatively new mass spectrometry technique. Now, there's some disadvantage of these minor species, difficult to really meaningfully detect. Sodium and potassium attachment ions, they're present in biological systems with high concentrations, millimolar concentrations of sodium if you pull them out of a, of a biological extract. And sometimes they form attachment ions and they, they add more ions, which make it difficult to understand. No chromatography is used to enhance that, so it actually is a very fast process. But certainly there are some compounds you just can't deal with if you don't do chromatography. These turn out to be two isobaric, the same mass, um, phosph uh, phospholipids, phosphatidylglycerol, and this is BMP is a bismonoacylglycerol phosphate. It's sort of an isomer of that. And you can't tell the difference between them if you just do this kind of single stage mass spectrometry. Nonetheless, it's it's really easy to implement, and any a lab that has these advanced machines can do this sort of stuff. And you can get a lot of information from this, and, uh, and, and that's, that's very useful. Can be useful maybe to address your biological question. Now, the chromatography-based uh, system, LCMS, LCMS, uh, is another popular method of doing it. It institutes chroma chromatographic separation before you do analysis. So this is now a tandem quadrupole mass spectrometer. <clears throat> and the front end of this here has a device which makes ions out of a, out of a, a, a solution. It's called electrospray ionization. It's revolutionized mass spectrometry as it's applied to biochemistry. It's allowed us to look at intact proteins, in, intact uh, oligonucleotides, uh, and certainly intact li uh, lipid substances, which we really couldn't before the development of electrospray. And, and John Fenn got the Nobel Prize for the development of that technique. Um, anyhow, we have before that uh, a separation. I illustrated this with normal phase separation. We also do a lot, most people do reverse phase separation, but lipid uh, biochemistry is very useful to do normal phase separation. You separate polarity rather than lipophilicity, which is reverse phase. Uh, so anyhow, that's, we think that's a very useful technique. So you inject the sample onto the column, you develop your chromatographic system to separate what you want. In this case, we're looking at neutral lipids, and so we're using something very nonpolar, hexane, methyl tertiary butyl ether. Now, that won't electrospray, so we have to add a solution which makes this, the, uh, the effluent of the column conductive. And so now we can make, uh, use the electrospray uh, process to separate ions, and they now enter the mass spectrometer right here. Now, once they're entering here, they enter, enter into a high vacuum system. And these are guide tubes to bring ions into uh, one quadrupole region. And by quadrupole, we mean a, a four rod set, which has a complex uh, AC and DC current electrical fields, which they're obviously oscillating if it's AC. And that affects mass separation, mass filtration. So you can run this machine to separate a particular ion. And then once an ion is separated from all the other ions, it enters in a second quadrupole field where you increase the pressure. And so whereas the, the likelihood of any collisions happening in this first quadrupole region are virtually non-existent, once they enter this pressure regime, they probably will have four to five collisions. The pressure is still very low. It's you know sub uh, millibar pressure, but uh, nonetheless, there'll be about typically four the five collisions. And once you have collisions, you change the energy of the ion, which is the energy of kinetic energy of movement, into vibration of the ion. And they start vibrating as they collide. And they vibrate enough through enough collisions that they can break covalent bonds. 
So now the molecule breaks apart and you use this third quadrupole. This turns out to be, in this example here, an, uh, a linear ion trap. And you can now collect the ions in here and then scan them out and analyze what is the mass of the product of these molecules. And so that information of this triple quadrupole allows you to understand precursor versus product in a chemical reaction, a collision-induced chemical reaction. Uh, so it's gas phase ion chemistry. You could run this machine to look for neutral losses, so you offset the mass here with, the, with the, what you uh, analyze over here by a neutral mass, that neutral loss scanning, that's one of the experiments. Precursor ion scanning is you set this to bit look at one mass, let's say mass 281, the mass for oleic acid anion, as a negative ion, and then you scan this machine, and so when they collisionally induce, only those ions which have a certain mass will make mass 281. So you'll find out all those ions which give this precursor 281. So there's a very versatile, there's about seven different experiments you can do with this machine by, ch by changing how you run this machine. All of this happens in microseconds. So the ions are moving in here, the, the slowest one, highest mass one, is moving probably about five to 10 microseconds. So things are happening very quick. Obviously, we don't live in that time scale. So this all has to be connected to a computer, which is controlling everything. Uh, and so what happens in my lab is the experiment is set up with the computer programs of the, run these mass spectrometers, and then everyone goes has coffee. Because they, they don't know what, they can't control anything. It just happens, and things are separating, and now you come back and look at all the data. This is a, with one of the types of data you get out of such a machine. This is a separation of normal human plasma by, no, by normal phase. You see very early cholesterol esters come out, and they're very nonpolar. Uh, they come out very fast. <coughs> they don't interact with a, with a silica-based uh, normal phase material very well, so they're coming off here. These are uh, e ether diglycerides, and these are triglycerides, and here's diglycerides, here's a little bit of cholesterol gives a negative signal. Even though there's a lot of it, they don't form negative ions, very, uh, positive ions that well. And so they sort of give a negative response. Now these don't look like great chromatographic peaks, but it turns out that's because there are thousands of molecules in there of different structures. And they all chromatograph slightly different. So it looks pretty terrible. So this is not a good way to look for an individual molecule. Now I collected all the ions in this peak and you can see them down here. And these are cholesterol esters, and we call these molecular species. These are cholesterol esters where you have a cholesterol with a fatty acid group attached to it. <clears throat> and we have millimolar concentrations of these molecules circulating in your body right now. And even more if you go to McDonald's, there'll be a lot of these. Uh, but you can see we, we get a signal for various ones. Here's one with palmitate, palmitoleate, uh, uh, here's some linoleate. Um, and here's oleate, and here's arachidonate, and DHA is out here, and here's 20. So there's about 20 of these common cholesterol esters that you have in blood, some major, some minor. And so you can easily see you've now separated those ions early in the chromatographic run, and you're not confused. You know by their chromatographic retention time, these are cholesterol esters. So that helps you in identifying these, these molecules. Uh, it turns out for the, the triglycerides, much more complex uh, kind of um, number of ions which are coming out here. And also this technique, you also get free ones. This is a prenol lipid, ubiquinone. It's one of the common things which are present from the prenol pathway. And sometimes you get molecules made in New Jersey. It, it just happens. And so we get pl plasticizers from bags where, where blood is collected. So that's chromatographic based separation of lipidomics. And uh, you really, we really rely on the separation power of the, of the chromatographic column. I've shown you separation by polarity with that normal phase. A lot of people use reverse phase and separate by lipophilicity. If you want a broad range of classes of molecules, it's kind of tough to do that because then you mix the, the, the classes together because the lipophilicity uh, drives the separation, not the polar head group. And sometimes the polar head group becomes what you really want to prove what you're looking at. It certainly improves identification of the lipids. I'll talk about that. That's really one of the real problems in this whole area. 
and it can improve sensitivity because you separate these molecules from each other. And so the small peaks now are not covered up by other classes which are very large. So you can figure out what things are. Now what's the disadvantages? And this is what, what they always complain about, those who do shotgun lipidomics. This takes a long time. So that you're driven by the chromatographic separation, which could be 20 to 30 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. You, we're certainly improving the separation time these days, but nonetheless, to go through the process of doing that separation and then regenerating the column so it's ready to take another sample and so on like that. that can, can, whereas shotgun lipidomics, you might run through, easily run through maybe 20, 30, 50 samples a day. Here, you're going to probably run five. Or, or maybe if you have a second crew come in or you have graduate students working for you who can run all night, uh, you, can, you can run a lot more than that. But anyhow, time is, is, is the overhead of the, of the time becomes an important price. Okay, so what is targeted lipidomics? Well, it's really based on chromatography, but you sort of shortcut this identification process because you set up your analysis to just look at specific molecules. And that relies upon ion chemistry. So I've, sh I've shown you, I'll show you here the ion chemistry of a prostaglandin. Uh, this is PGE2, here's the chemical structure. This is the collision induced decomposition spectrum when you focus 351, the first quadrupole, collisionally activated, it makes all these product ions. And if you study these, you can figure out where they are derived from. In fact, the one they're looking at is 271 here. And it sort of, we think, has this structure here after this decarboxylation, double bond changes, dehydration, and now you have this structure here. And so that's rather unique for that molecule. Not many other molecules do that ion chemistry. So this becomes a, another signature for the identity of this molecule. It has a certain retention time and it, it starts out the precursors, 351 ends up in the third quadrupole as 271. Now to really do this, we typically add a deuterium labeled molecule. So this is, has four deuteriums in it. Deuterium adds one more mass unit than, than a proton. It's mass two instead of mass one. And so this is now four Daltons heavier. So you see, we're now looking here at 355 instead of 351. And when you collisionally activate it, some of the ions are the same, but 271 shifts to 274 because it still has those four deuterium atoms on that product. And so once you know this, and you have to study these molecules to really know this, you can't predict this necessarily, you can set up this precursor product relationship and set your mass spectrometer only to do that precursor product switching during the chromatographic run. So an example is looking at all of the metabolites of arachidonic acid, which are formed in the peritoneal cavity of uh, mice that have been injected with zymazan, little yeast particles, cell wall particles, and the, the macrophages in the peritoneal cavity phagocytize these particles and they, it initiates the arachidonic acid cascade to make both prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And so you can see that you can measure leukotriene B4 by looking at 335 going to 195, 5E by looking at 319 then going to 115, and leukotriene E4, 438 to 333. There, there, there are uh, different pairs of ions you're, do, you're switching to. So as the chromatographic column comes, uh, the compounds elute, you're switching the machine in a very rapid fashion uh, between these ion pairs. So how many can you do? So in the old days, 10 years ago, uh, you know, you would probably be able to do maybe 10 of these within what we call the duty cycle, the circle you go around. Uh, going through those, those ion pairs. The newer machines, you can do 100. They're just much more rapid scanning and they, you can really make a big long list of these. So it turns out you can just do many, many molecules by this, um, this uh, targeted approach. So and once again, it's this targeted approach is you know something about the ion chemistry. For example, if you want to look at phospholipids, and you may, want, you may want to do it by negative ions. I'll show you the reason shortly. Collisionally activate that, that negative ion and you look for, for example, products which contain mass to charge ratio 303. Now 303 turns out to be the mass of the arachidonic acid uh, carboxylate anion. And so when you do this, you would identify 
molecules which, are, which have arachidonic acid and sterified to it. So the new machines do this very rapidly uh, and within the, uh, not only that, within the LC time frame you can change that list of let's say a hundred uh, uh, ones you want to look at depending upon the time of evolution. You do it very quickly, computers are doing this very quickly and so you can actually make that number I'll, uh, we published a paper recently with, with this one here with uh, 960 MRM transitions and that was measuring virtually all the phospholipids which the major phospholipids which would be present in a cell extract and this is now a list that you can't read that the idea wasn't for you to read those things but if you want this you can look at the publication and we, we published all this. Uh, you can see what, what species, these are phosphatidylcholines, uh, this is, um, these are phosphatidylethanolamines, these are phosphatidylethanolamines, there's just 96 on that page there, uh, and the machine is going through these things in a time dependent manner, choosing which ones it wants to do, depending upon where phosphatidylcholine elutes, where phosphatidylethanolamine, where PI elutes, where PG elutes, where BMP eludes and so on like that. So you can sort out all these different classes uh, and get a very accurate measure of the, uh, the, the actual lipids which are present. Um, now, this sort of brings us back to the identification. So th when you set up the targeted machine uh, or, or targeted process, you're actually knowing what you're going to be measuring. So you know what the identity is. What about identifying lipids by either li the chromatographic systems or by the shotgun systems? Well, I, as I say here, this is really the most challenging and also where egregious errors can occur. Now, I turn out to be half, I'm one of the watchdogs for one of the journals that uh, is, publishes a lot of li lipidomic studies. So I see a lot of these things. And so I'm going to show you uh, an example of some egregious errors. But first of all, let me, um, explain to you what is the information that a mass spectrometer gives you. So this is an example, a hypothetical example more or less, although it's real data, <coughs> of a phosphat phosphatidylcholine and sort of was isolated by thin layer chromatography and it was a pure molecule so it's not quite fair there. Normally in biology you would have many species, but in this case you only had one. So what does a mass spectrometer tell you? It tells you the mass, the charge ratio, of the ion you're looking at, turns out to be a positive ion. You sort of guess it's protonated, but it doesn't have to necessarily have to be. It could be sodiated if it's from a biological extract. And we, if we do some control of your extraction procedure, wash it out, try and get rid of the, of the sodium ions, you can get it to be just protonated. So you say that's a protonated molecular ion. So what do we know by this experiment? That's all the mass spectrometer is giving you is that mass. Well, you can say, well, probably the molecular weight, since it's M plus H is 746, the molecular weight is 745. And that is all you can say uh, from it. Now, it turns out a lot of people are doing much more interpretation of that. And especially if you do have a computer trying to interpret this data, they give you a lot more information, which is incorrect. Now, one of the things we can do is measure this to high resolution. And what do I mean by that? Well. Certain machines, like a time of flight machine, a modern time of flight machine, Orbitrap or Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance machine can give you a measurement of that mass to really uh, put them here to the third decimal place, but the Orbitrap and the FTICR can, can measure them to the fourth decimal place. Now it turns out nature has been kind to us, but not kind to you as students, because you probably learned that the carbon's 12, hydrogen's 1, oxygen's 16, nitrogen's 14. Well, that not quite true. Nature made them all non-integer um, values. So we set the standard to carbon, and we call carbon, the physical standard, as 12. And we measure everything relative to carbon. Now, it turns out a proton is not mass 1, but it's mass 1.007825. So way out there in the third decimal place, it starts to differ. Nitrogen is not 14, it's 14.003. And oxygen is not 16, but it's 15.9949. It's mass deficient. Those little numbers can add up and one can mathematically calculate what the elemental composition is if you measure the mass 
uh, to the, the least the third decimal place and have it accurate. So this 746 could be 746.565, in which case uh, I'll show you, you can calculate the elements. It is a phosphatidylcholine with 33 acyl carbons and, and one double bond, or it could be 746.606, and that would have to be an ether phosphatidylcholine 341. Now, here's some structures of those masses, but I want to just show you the elemental composition. This elemental composition here has one less carbon than this elemental composition and has one more oxygen than this elemental composition and four more protons. And those differences, those little mass differences add up and if you add, measure it accurately, you can calculate what the elemental composition is. Certainly for lipids, which are below mass 1000, you can do that. So once you get above mass 1000, it becomes a little bit more challenging. Now you don't really uniquely calculate those elemental compositions, you get a table of potential elemental compositions within the experimental error, and you need to know how accurate your machine is in measuring that, and so that's the precision of your measurement. That's why we talk about parts per million measurement. Parts per million are down to this level right here. Um, so anyhow, you can see there's two possibilities. This is a diacyl phosphatidylcholine. This is an ether phosphatidylcholine, has only one ester group, that's an alkyl ether at SN1. And I show this because your, your uh, chairman of uh, pharmacology loves ether phospholipids. He, he really loves them so much. If you look at him after this talk, he's got a tie with an ether phospholipid on. I mean, that's, that's pretty extreme. Uh, anyhow, this is an ether phospholipid. Okay. So, um, The tandem quadrupole mass spectrometer, uh, this is, a, is not that high resolution machine. Um, if one couples a quadrupole to time of flight, one can get that very, very high resolution measurement of the ions. So that's why we have these different machines, different ways you make them. So if you see a positive ion now here is 760, you can tell from this positive ion, and if you measure it at high resolution, you can sort of tell the number of of fatty acyl groups present number of double bonds. And so when you collisionally activate that ion, what you get is this product ion 760 decomposes to this ion 184. And that transition tells you this is a phosphatidylcholine. 184 comes from this part of the molecule, the phosphocholine part, part of the molecule, and that's unique to the positive ion collision induced decomposition. This same molecule, a phosphatidylcholine, can give you negative ions. Yes, we can get negative ions out of a quaternary ammonium compound through de uh, demethylation of the molecule, which occurs very readily. And so now it shifts down to a loss of methyl, 744. When you collisionally activate that, you get very different ions. And these ions are the, the acyl groups from the two fatty acyl esters, which are on phosphatidylcholine. So you can tell this is a phosphatidylcholine from the positive ions and that the acyl groups are palmitate and 18 with one double bond. And so that's coming from this sort of information. The ratio of these ions can be interpreted, although it's, it's not uh, absolutely uh, the, the same for all molecules, but it usually tells you what's at the SN1 and what's at the SN2 position. Dangerous to really, uh, use that to, to assign the isolation of these, but nonetheless, uh, it is useful information. Now, this is a shame, shameful uh, plug for a book that I wrote, and, it's, uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, uh, but if you want to learn more about ion chemistry of lipids, I go through all the lipid classes in this book, and you can see how, what is the mechanism for the formation of these ions? It comes from that phosphate anion attacking these carbons and then transferring the charge to the anions and so on like that uh, for all classes of lipids from steroids to the fatty ACL compounds. Now the problem can come in where a lot of people don't understand what level you are really identifying the molecule when you're doing mass spectrometry. I sort of went through these in, in already but you can see that just measuring the mass you have some questions about what it, here's here are uh, eight different possibilities for what that mass could be. These are all the same mass, 
of phosphatidylcholine. And to really sort out which one of these species is really there, you have to do either high resolution to tell you whether it's a diacetyl or an ether phospholipid or tandem mass spectrometry to tell you what fatty acids are in there. So you gotta go through those experiments to really determine and that where you are now uh, allowed to say you know what this phosphatidylcholine is uh, as either a, uh, an ether phospholipid which has a, a palmate oleate, ester, single ester, or an ether phospholipid, uh, sorry, which is the, uh, has, has, I can almost see that. Is that 18-1? Yeah, so uh, which is a different fatty acid group and a different chain length on the ether. And so those are isomeric molecules and that's what lipids are full of, is isomeric molecules. So to really do this, sometimes we have to do several stages, <coughs> excuse me, of mass spectrometry to sort that out. A very good paper I've quoted right here, uh, which really helps you understanding where you are in, in your level of being allowed to say you know the mass spectrum of this molecule. Now, at the very end, uh, you're going to probably think it's, that 18-1 is oleate, but you've not done the experiment to really show where that double bond is. All you know, there's one double bond in that chain. So we have computer programs which have been evolved and companies can make money on these uh, to really help you identify what these what these lipids are in these very complex mixtures that you get from biological extracts. Uh, this is just to make, show there's a lot of them out there. Uh, probably lipid view from Sykes is one of the better ones. Uh, the thermal group and the water group are probably some of the worst ones. But I wanted to show you data. It turned out to be from an, an, the, the company Agilent of a manuscript that was submitted to the journal that I associated thereof. And they gave a list of 500 molecules which were identified um, by, by lipidomic studies. And this is what their list was. And I pulled out some of these. Here's a fatty acyl. They said this is uh, 20 with four. I'm not sure what N minus three means. I presume that means that's an uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acid. And then it gives 6, 9, 15. I assume what that meant was that's the position of the double bonds. There's only three of them but it says it's 20 with four. Where's the fourth one? Ah, they didn't say that. And it turns out that's not arachidonic acid. Those are the wrong positions for double bonds in arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is 5, 8, 11, 15. They said there was PGD2 based on the molecular, uh, molecular ion PGD2D4. Well, they didn't add PGD2D4, and that's an unnatural compound. That's a stabilized soap labeled molecule. So if they didn't add it, there's no way it can be in there because it ha that has to be made in a, a, by synthetic chemistry. So that can't be true. And then probably one of the worst ones is this laterane that they claim was a, was a neutral lipid. How many of you know what laterines are? No one. That's probably just fine. Laterines were discovered several years ago as, as complex lipids from the the uh, carbo uh, cation kind of biosynthesis um, in deep sea sediments from the Black Sea. Likely this human uh, sample did not eat something from the Black Sea, but they could have eaten some sturgeons, you know, some caviar. But anyhow, here they have stereochemistry, double bond positions, and so on like that. So here are what the structures, the structure of that molecule looks like. Stereochemistry, that's the SN stereochemistry right there. Here are the laterines. They didn't determine any of this. So the computer program said it was in there based upon limited information that they did, the experiments they did, and it was totally incorrect. And that's is sort of a problem with lipidomics if you were going to rely on computer programs to, to look at your data and tell you what it is. Uh, you've got to know something about lipid biochemistry and what these, what these structures are, or you're going, to, you're going to try and publish incorrect data. That's no way to be a scientist. Uh, so anyhow, that's, that's one of my pet peeves, is really trying to understand what, what these things are. So let me go on down now to quantitative analysis. Uh, another part of, important part of lipidomic studies. Once you've identified the molecule, the next question you're going to ask is how much of it is there? And so that brings up the whole topic. How do you do quantitative analysis of these compounds? So the secret we have to this 
is that you don't do quantitation based on the absolute signal that you're measuring because that's a very poor measure of the quantity which is there because you can easily change in the mass spectrometer the absolute signal or sensitivity of the molecule just by uh, sort of a knob of the old, uh, sorry, the old machines had knobs on them, sorry. The new machines don't have them, they're all computer controlled. So, but you could change them very easily by the voltage you have in the electron multiplier, by how well you're focusing the ions, how long they're, they're in the uh, flight tube and so on like that. So that's a very poor way of, the, of, of measuring it. So we add something to the sample where we know the quantity we add and we know what the substance is and we, relative, and we measure the ratio of that signal to what we add. So it's the signal to the internal standard. That's the only secret we have. That's how quantitation is done in, in lipidomics. So with that, um, one can generate then these standard curves but I wanted to show you sort of what that's all based on. And this is sort of trying to understand what is the relationship between the ion signal you measure, the ion intensity of a certain mass to charge ratio, to the lipid concentration. And there is a relationship. It's a function of the lipid concentration. That's good news. It's also a function of ionization cross-section. So if you're measuring phosphatidyl and think you're measuring phosphatidyl and inositol, as a positive ion, the ionization cross-section for phosphatidyl and inositol is virtually zero. So this function goes to zero if you're trying to measure phosphatidyl and inositol or sphingosine 1-phosphate or something which makes very abundant negative ions or sulfatides. But if you're measuring phosphatidylcholine, the ionization cross-section is very good because it's already pre-ionized in solution and all you do is separate ion from an ion pair, counter ion pair. So that's very good. Ion stability. Some ions are very stable. They, it's like, like rocks. It's hard to decompose them. Some ions, you just think about them and they decompose, and that, that's always a problem. But, 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 ha, but that's a nature of the molecule itself as it goes through a mass spectrometer, is ion stability. Uh, instrument factors are how the instrument is, is behaving, that, how clean it is. What, what the various voltages are, and sort of it's sort of a, a, a feature of the molecule of the molecule on the day you're analyzing, and it can change. So this is something which is quite variable. So if you do this ratio business, a lot of these these variables. There's many other variables I'm not going to talk about, uh, but the, those are the major ones. <coughs> it reduces to the lipid concentration, ionization cross section, and ion stability. So with those variables one can set up a reference standard and so you measure with a reference something you know as measured a quantitative standard that you have bought and you know is pure and the manufacturer tells you the purity of it and you measure the you add that to um, a known amount of internal standard at various levels and you generate this curve which is a sort of a, a calibration curve uh, here you add various picomoles of a triglyceride to a standard amount of internal standard and you can see the, the 48 with zero, the, the fully saturated triglyceride has a slope of this. So now you can interpret the ratio that you're measuring of a triglyceride in a biological sample, a separate experiment, to the internal standard. And you can tell exactly how many picomoles you have of that triglyceride. Now you see the molecule, type of molecule, changes the slope. In fact, the double bonds determine largely what that slope is, and that's because that's driving ion stability right here. It turns out those with double bonds are less stable, so you get a lower signal. Now the way to even make it better is to do this with a stable isotope labeled internal standard. And so that, what that means is that the identical molecule except it has a stable isotope like carbon-13, deuterium, multiple de de deuterium atoms, uh, maybe some nitrogen 15s or oxygen 18s in them. And so it's the same molecule. So chemically it's identical and it only differs in mass. And so there, therefore, all of these factors cancel out. And so the, uh, the ratio is really quite proportional to the, to the signal. Uh, the concentration is quite proportional to the signal ratio you measure. So that turns out to be, in fact, that is the primary standard that that the National Institutes of Standard and Technology uses to quantitate anything is stable isotope dilution by mass spectrometry. That's, that's what is accepted as the only real gold standard to do quantitation. And so this becomes a very useful way to do things. Okay, there's another way to do it, and I wanted to sort of tell you about this because this, 
to do the absolute quantitation, it's possible, but you have to get reference standards and you have to do all of these separate experiments of getting calibration curves. But you don't have to if you want to answer a biological question. At least my position is you don't necessarily have to. You're limited in being able to compare your results with, a, with another uh, set of experiments, but within a subscri subscribed set of experiments, let's say you have 50 samples and you want to measure how lipids are changing, you can do relative quantitation. Now, it turns out in, in biochemistry, that's used a lot. It, like in, in when you measure genes, you don't measure absolute concentration of any, you always measure their ratios to, to a standard. And that's, that's what you're using. So relative standards, uh, you can measure that directly from the data without calibrating your internal standard. Uh, and you don't have to worry about the purity of your internal standard. And so that becomes quite useful. So let me show you what the, how that can be useful. This is an example of all the phosphatidylcholines which are present in a mouse heart. And the first thing you notice, there are blue traces and red traces. The blue traces are a normal wild type mouse and the red traces are isolated from the heart, which is, has uh, an ACL-CoA long chain uh, synthetase knocked out. So it's absent in that animal. So the first thing you notice is, well, that gene defect causes changes in molecular species of phospholipids. Uh, and there are some of, some of them which are, <coughs> are, are, are quite uh, much more abundant in the knockout mouse than they are <coughs> in the wild type. And uh, it, you can see there's not much mass spec space in here to put internal standards, let alone internal standards for each one of those different phospholipids. It becomes almost impossible to do that. So typically with phospholipids, we say, okay, I, I give up. I can only add one internal standard and I'm going to measure, if I get my hands on all of these phospholipids, use them as reference standards. Well, it turns out for phosphatidylcholines, you can maybe buy uh, pure, probably f maybe 30 different molecular species. You're looking at uh, maybe 150. Some are big, some are small. You're not gonna cover that whole area. So it's gonna be a problem. But if you just measure the ratios of those signals to an internal standard, which I apologize, it was, it was a very low mass. It's not on that curve right there, but they were normalized to the internal standard. You can take that ratio and plot it out here and you get to have a good idea. We've only identified these phospholipids by the total number of fatty acyl groups and double bonds. You can see the ones which are really popping up are the ones with highly polyunsaturated fatty acids present. 40 was six, 38 was six, uh, are in the, uh, in the wild type, but when they're knocked out, they're actually quite a bit uh, reduced. The ones which are quite big in the knockout and not as big in the wild type are the much more saturated molecules. This is telling you something about that enzyme in terms of how it handles fatty acyl CoAs to esterify them in, but into CoA esters. It's doing a much better job with the saturated fatty, more saturated fatty acids than it is with the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So th that's telling you information right away. So the final part of this is, is to look at the statistical analysis of this, and I'll try and go over this quickly. Um, but this is sort of where you hopefully you're going to get. You've identified the molecules of all the lipids you're going to have, and you have to deal with all these different lipid uh, molecular species. So I want to go over very quickly a simple experiment. Uh, in fact, here at Wright State, this experiment's probably done virtually every day in multiple labs. Uh, not done quite the way that I'm doing it here, but I'm going to take some cells, <clears throat> just put them in a um, cell culture plate, a dish, and, and then plate them out and then wait either one day, two days, or three days. And very often this is what people are doing. They're plating out the cells, waiting three days and doing an experiment. But I'm going to ask the question here, are there any changes in the phospholipids during the course of just the cell sitting there in the plate? And in particular, I'm quite inter interested, uh, why I did this experiment, in the land cycle. So land cycle is how we re polyunsaturated fatty acids into, uh, into phospholipids. And, um, and then the last part of this, are there any changes, which, uh, which are significant in terms of the biochemistry of these cells? Uh, this is just the experiment, once again, it's targeted analysis, and we, we looked at all the polyunsaturated fatty acids. There's about 100 of those. 
So one of the ways we come to grips with this data with all these different lipids, we measure these three times so we have some statistical measure of the variation which is happening. And this is a volcano plot where we're looking at those molecules by and large which are above 0.05 in significance in the simple t-test, so anything above that. And also their fold difference is either, uh, this means they're high, more abundant in day one if they're negative, more abundant if they're day, in day three if they're positive. And you can see this separates the data and the size of the circle and the color is something about an abundance of that lipid. But what you see very quickly in this analysis, there are some lipids. For example, more abundant in day one, a lot of arachidonic containing phospholipids are abundant. By day three, not so many, they're mostly 20 with three, which are more abundant. And that's changed, just sit, having the cells sit there. You can also do box plots. Here's a particular molecular species, 16 ether, 20 with four, very abundant day one, not so abundant day three, just the opposite, 16 ether, 20 with three, not very abundant day one, very abundant by day three. This all changed. So where are they, they coming from? What is that 20 with three? Well, normally 20 with three, when we think about biochemistry, we think 20 polyunsaturated fatty acids come from linoleic acid or linolenic acid and minus three. These are all dietary things. And so to get down to arachidonic acid, you go through a 20 with three. Is that 20 with three here? And so there's a problem with, with this fatty acid desaturase one that can form arachidonate, or is it this 20 with three, which has to do with elongase uh, from linolenic acid? Well, it turns out neither one of those, we determined the position of the double bonds, something I don't have time to talk about, but if someone asked me, I would be glad to go on about <laughs> the, how we do that. It turns out the 20 with three is called meat acid. Now, meat acid comes from an a, a fatty acid we can actually make uh, uh, in mammalian cells, oleic acid, and it goes through a, uh, the, the two fatty acid desaturases, the uh, delta-6 and the, and, uh, the, uh, the uh, delta-5 desaturase, then elongase. And so here we have meat acid, 5, 8, 11, 20 with, it turns out it was that fatty acid, 20 with 3, because we went to the trouble of determining where the position of the double bonds were. And that's the one which is increasing as these cells simply age in a, in a, in a dish. And it turns out, uh, I, I should mention, these, to make arachidonic acid, you must have a dietary intake of linoleic acid. That's an essential fatty acid we cannot make fatty acids of this omega-6 family. We cannot make fatty acids of the omega-3. We have to either eat, uh, if you eat fish oil, you eat EPA, but to make DHA a very common polyunsaturated fatty acid, it comes from this omega-3 pathway and the uh, omega-6 pathway to make arachidonic acid. That must come from diet. And in cells, the food you give cells is typically serum and they are using that up and so it's missing. So that's why you're making meat acid. Does that make a difference? Well, it turns out uh, it makes a big difference in terms of prostaglandin production. You can see that the prostaglandins are decreasing with culture. Uh, these, these, these black traces, the stimulated cells are decreasing because the enzymatic process, this is the, en the essential feature of cyclooxygenase, a tyrosyl radical pulling off this carbon-13 uh, uh, hydrogen atom here and attaching oxygen. That's the first step of, this, of cyclooxygenase. And 20 with 3 does not have that bissel of proton, so it can't do this. What about leukotrienes? Leukotrienes, same story. They C4, B4, and just arachidonic acid decreases. Uh, but a new one increases C3 and B3 because the, the mechanism of 5-lipoxygenase pulls off a carbon-7 hydrogen atom, and that's present in meat acid. So it'll do that. So you will have, and the, the pharmacological properties of the three series leukotrienes are different from the four series. And of course, if you're missing prostaglandins, then their things are going to change. So it does make a biochemical difference. The very last example, I want to talk about a recent study. We did a clinical study with a pros prospective study trying to find with lipidomic challenges, uh, with uh, li uh, lipidomic approaches, can we find lipids which might predict prematurity? 
Now, it turns out worldwide, and this was funded by the Gates Foundation, worldwide, um, about one third of all pregnancies results in problems like, like uh, hypertension in the mother, preeclampsia, uh, like premature birth, um, breaking of the membranes and so on like that, about a third of them. And they're serious problems, that's a serious burden of cost worldwide if you don't know a person is going to have um, an adverse pregnancy outcome. And it'd be nice if everyone could predict that. Uh, so we, we did a small study. This is 133 individuals, and we don't know what they're going, which class they're going to be in, but predict about a third of them are going to have premature births. And it, that turned out to be true. Now we measured by targeted methods uh, in plasma, some lipids like sterols, uh, steroids, single lipids, and, and uh, in urine we measured uh, uh, Icosanoid metabolites and sphingolipids and so like that. So we measured a whole panel of these things and we wanted to find out are there any markers. And we did find some. I'm not going to talk about those, but it was a ratio of prostaglandins to, to steroids that turned out to be pretty predictive. But I wanted to show you this aspect of, of what lipidomics can provide to you. And that's what we looked at the steroid data. So here's our volcano plot. And one of the interesting things which came up was testosterone was really quite uh, more abundant of these, this code is TA, that's a term birth divided by preterm birth concentrations. And it terms, turns out they were much higher in the preterm birth, which is why it's a negative number, uh, than it was in term birth. But we dug a little bit deeper in the data and here's just a bar graph of that data. And you don't really look at the, the, all the points which are in here, unfortunately. But uh, here you see what's unique about this is the, is the error bar on that testosterone was probably driving this, this observation. So we went and looked at the data and plotted that out, just as all the samples are plotted out here. <clears throat> and there's some sort of normal level, average of about 0.7 um, uh, picomoles per mil um, in, in most uh, pregnant women, uh, independent of um, their, their uh, stage of, these are all, um, these were all, all the samples, both preterm and term births. And if you say, well, what's above sort of seven standard deviations? That's a huge number, so different. And here is one. This patient 2V547 had a huge number. And we looked at the data and the data was right. And so that wasn't an artifact and we, we redid the samples and it turned out that was true. We looked at urine samples and indeed their testosterone was, had that large error and it turned out that it was the same patient which had this, this very high level of testosterone. Now, in the lipidomic study that we, we included in the panel of steroids that we measured, and this is the biochemical pathway of forming steroids and testosterone is down here, coming from cholesterol, down here, lots of biochemical pathways and we measured all those with stars. So we had this complex pathway pretty well covered in terms of what, uh, and this is what you can do with these, these target approaches. And here are the, are the structures of, the, of these various compounds. And I put it on here. These compounds on, on mostly on this side were elevated, whereas those over here, they were not elevated and the bottleneck appeared to be aromatase. So likely what we picked out was an individual which was probably um, had a genetic defect in, in aromatase. And so they were trying to drive the production of estrogens, which they needed in pregnancy, and they increased the concentrations of the precursors of the estrogens to maintain a level of estrogens they needed. And that probably leads to problems when you drive that much testosterone in a woman, a pregnant woman in particular. So, so what's an interesting about this is that it's difficult to form, to, to find human, humans which are natural knockouts. But it turns out if you do things like this with lipids, you can probably find these. And there's been a couple other examples where they've gone in and they find individuals who are highly divergent from a normal population. They have sequenced the genome of those individuals and they find indeed in one case, it was a cytochrome P450, which formed, uh, it was on the pathway to form bile acids. 
Uh, so anyhow, that is sort of an, another interesting way that one can use this kind of approach. And otherwise, it's almost impossible to find natural human knockouts. So this is, this is useful when you have large clinical studies and you can, you can study that. So the conclusion of all this, I probably went a little too long. Sorry about that. But it wasn't my fault. We were late starting, so <laughs> it wasn't my fault. Um, mass spectrometry is a very powerful technique. It's powerful in in proteins, in, in nucleic acid research, and certainly powerful in, in, in lipid biochemistry. Um, there are some easy techniques to engage with to, to study the complexity of lipid biochemistry. I, I think one of the things you really want to, if you are contemplating doing something like this, you want to really question, are they identifying lipids correctly? Software right now is not good enough to do that, and it's not telling you at what le level that you're identifying it. And the easy way to look at that is, does it tell you stereochemistry or position of double bonds? Well, that's not easy to get unless you really do some other experiments. And if it's doing that for you, the software, you probably really want to question they know what they're doing when they wrote that software. Relative quantitation, which is looking at the ratio of the sample to the internal standard, gives you a nice way to really look at in a, um, a lot of data fairly quickly. You have to run the samples virtually uh, within the same several days with the same internal standard and so on like that. Absolute quantitation is certainly possible. It's much more work, but it, li but it, it gives you very precise and accurate measures of, of lipid concentrations. There are certainly challenges remaining in this technique. Internal standards, there's not a huge number available, even a smaller number of reference standards compared to the total number of lipid molecular species there are. Um, but there is real promise in this technique for the future. So I put artificial intelligence, a nice little keyword people are thinking about these days. This is using the computer to really try and understand your lipid concentrations you're measuring or relative concentrations and putting them on a bigger picture of uh, biochemical pathways. And in one case, I've shown you how we can use it to, to identify natural gene deficiencies. So with that, I thank you. Um, this is a picture of some of the people that returned to my lab last year when I retired. Uh, and yes, I am unemployed uh, and I, I, I do not work anymore. Uh, my lab is closed on, and it was, it's sort of a hard thing to do, but that's what I did. And you notice all these people don't seem to care. <laughs> that, um, but then the, the last part of this is that I would like that. How many of you pay taxes to the United States of America? Oh, don't be shy. <laughs> is there anyone who doesn't do that? Well, I want to thank you because my work is supported by your tax dollars. Uh, had, has been for the last, uh, well, 47 years. Uh, and it's really through the auspices of the National Institutes of Health where I've gotten my funding to do this research. And, and I do thank you for your payment of taxes. Uh, it allowed, allowed me to get a salary and to, and to uh, and to really delve into lipid biochemistry. And with that, I thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Murphy? I have my hearing aid on, so I think I'll be able to hear you. I was wondering, did you look at the differences in natural versus human lipid biochemistry? Did you look at the differences in natural versus human lipid biochemistry? Yeah, so we really haven't, we have that information. That's part of the metadata that was collected. And we're just now in the process of assembling all that. And we're having the people who are doing that are at Imperial College in London and their informatics group. And they now have all of our data and they're now going to try and look at issues like that. Now it turns out in, we had two populations. One was from uh, Virginia, which was, hi was highly African American. And the one from uh, the UK was a larger group, was, was much more diverse. Uh, because of the diversity of populations of individuals, excuse me, in the UK. Did you have more complications with the African American? Well, so I don't know the answer to that because I have we haven't done that decoding. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. The organism when you identify uh Yeah. So you have to do tandem mass spectrometry. You have to collisionally activate negative ions of those phospholipids. And then the carboxylate anions 
are the abundant product ions, and those, those abundant product ions tell you, is it 18-1 or 18-0, and 16-0 or 16-1. Those ACO groups tell you that. Now, they don't really tell you unless you do some other, looking at some other ions, what is at SN1 and what's at SN2. And so one of the problems, and so in this paper, which I pointed out to you, uh, it, it tells you what level you can probably designate this molecule. And we use the little um, trick of saying it's 16-0 underline 18-1. And that underline tells us we know there's both 16-0 and 18-1. We don't know if it's SN1 or SN2. Uh, and if, if you put a slash, then you've gone another extra step and looked for some different ions which do tell you what's SN1 and what's SN2. And those different ions are loss of the carboxylic acid neutral. And they're much more, less abundant, but you gotta, you gotta look for them and measure them. I've got a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'm just wondering, you mentioned that the softwares that are used to determine um, from your mass spec data the actual structures mm -hmm. um, are kind of faulty. Do you know how they're making those determinations? Like yeah. The algorithms are using? Right. So a lot of them are, uh, so the ones which are doing poorly are searching databases of which they're just measuring masses for, and they have an identity for it. And uh, I mean, so there's, you know, like Lipid Maps, the group that I'm involved with, has a big database of like about 35,000 of these things, but they're, it's virtually generated in silico. It just says this is the molecular weight and this is what that molecular ion tells you or it came from this compound. And it really wasn't done by tandem mass spectrometry to um, determine what the fatty acyl groups are, if it's a phospholipid or a triglyceride or, or even a steroid, uh, which class of steroid it is. Um, and so the ones which are a little bit better incorporate tandem mass spectral data in their search algorithm. And so they will have tandem spectra, pre, uh, some predicted ions they would expect to see if it was this species. And, um, but even some of those have gone to the extent of annotating them with stereochemistry, double bond positions, and that information is not in those ions they measure, so that's incorrect. So you just have to be a little bit weary, wary of, of that. And they're, they're trying to update their systems and being a little bit more intelligent about it. But some of the ones who have gone using sort of the approach that proteomics is used, and their, their, their algorithms are based upon the proteomics approach, which they don't have isomeric problems. There's only one uh, serine. There's not 25 different serine species. There's only one. So when you identify a mass loss of the serine residue, you say it's serine, with what you got. And, but and they think that's the story of lipids, and it's not. And we have many more isomeric molecules. Question. I have a question. Yes. Uh, as far as you know, you you can use these p cell molecules in hospitals for women who have this for p cell or cell cell. Yeah. So, so are they using this sort of approach of lipidomics in hospitals? Here yeah. They're not doing it now that I know of. However, that's sort of why we're on the leading edge of this. It turns out that if we, if we find um, that there is value in doing this, they may become more and more prevalent. They're being used in large clinical trials. So one of the examples is the Dallas Heart Study. I don't know if you know about the Dallas Heart Study, but it has about 4,000 patients in it which they have studied for the past, gotten samples from them, I think for the past 30 years. Sort of like the Framingham study, this is in Dallas. They're going through all their plasma samples trying to look for <coughs> uh, lipids which are predicting potential outcomes because they have a lot of outcome information now after 30 years. Some of them gotten cancer, some of them gotten emphysema, some of them uh, have gotten diabetes and, and uh, probably a lot of them got diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. And so they want to see do some of these lipids predict that and if they do can that be used to to intervene with a subject if they can measure it early enough and so on like that. So they're going through that, through those, but those are all, you know, uh, prospective studies. Uh, not right now, we don't know the answer to a lot of that stuff. So Dr. Murphy will be available afterwards um, for other questions. I'm going to take my prerogative as asking the last study, I mean, the last question. And for this, I'm going to ask for audience participation. Ooh. 
How many here in the audience uh, grow cultured cells in vitro? Raise your hand if you grow cultured cells. Anybody? I thought Everybody in my lab better be raising their hands. <laughs> so, what this data, one of the things I want you to take back from this is, say for example, you every day you plate the cells, two days later you do the experiment. But then one day you say, well, you know, maybe I'm not feeling so well. I have some friends called me, um, you know, they wanted to go out. Oh, well, maybe I'll do this experiment on my cultured cells tomorrow. Well, based upon this data, your cultured cells, day one, look different lipid, uh, by their lipidomics day two versus day three. So you better be consistent and don't have friends. <laughs> on that level, you can start doing that. Here is, um, you know, the, uh, the Earl H. Morris MD Endowed Lectureship. Ooh, we thank, thank you very much for being involved with this. Thank you very much. And we'll get a picture with the Morris family. And one final thing, our Department of Pharmacology, we come up with our own, we actually have, we're a department with a motto, <laughs> advancing research from molecule to man. So we, we have a t-shirt for oh, you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. So thank join you. us all outside for...